And I will make sure um, to ask Reverend Kavanagh how the recordings will be available. So Barbie, you're recording now? No, someone else clicked recording. <laughs> Who's recording? Because I need to know if I need to stop the recording when it's over. Hmm. You will. And then um, whoever started it might be starting it again. Okay. Hmm. Well, since, since we're recording, if, if someone comes in in another minute or two, they'll be able to catch up. In deference to Reverend Burnett's time, I, I think we should start. Okay. So again, I'm Sandy Shukun from Congregation Beth on Israel, and it is my great honor to present our next speaker. Reverend Miriam J. Burnett, MD, serves as the supervisor of the 18th Episcopal District and medical director of the International Health Commission of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was the first female pastor of Historic Jones Tabernacle AME Church in Philadelphia and is an ordained itinerant elder. In June 2020, Reverend Dr. Burnett was the National Council of Churches USA representative to the World Council of Churches consultation to discuss responses to COVID-19 and its implications for the future of the health and healing ministry this was the beginning of an active partnership with the World Health Organization. Reverend Dr. Burnett serves as the president of Resource and Promotion of Health Alliance, Inc., a nonprofit health education and promotion consulting company with 30 years of experience aiding faith-based and community organizations to optimize health for their communities. A U.S. Army veteran, she holds a Master of Public Health in Social and Behavioral Sciences from the Morehouse School of Medicine, as well as a Master of Divinity from Turner Seminary at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta. Dr. Burnett comp completed the Johns Hopkins University COVID-19 contact tracing certification and is the recipient of many awards, only one of which I will mention. In 2017, she received the American Public Health Association Black Caucus of Health Workers Poindexter Award commemorating a legacy of elegance in promoting health, especially for vulnerable communities. As a minister and medical doctor, Reverend Dr. Burnett is a strong advocate of holistic health, a concept that fuses physical, psychological, social, economic, and spiritual health. Her life work is focused on service with compassion, work with excellence, and love without bias, and she will address us on the impact of structural racism on people uh, and communities of color and vulnerable and COVID update. Reverend Burnett. Good morning and thank you so very much for that introduction. Every time I hear, hear it, I um, become concerned, become concerned that um, I may be uh, Oh, let's see, let's put it another way. Concern that uh, I am shining and not, the, and not my God. So um, thank you for that, that introduction. I would like to um, just let you know where we're going to go, how we're gonna get there today. Um, I don't like um, um, doing sessions where we, can't talk to each other. And being that I am sharing a screen, it's gonna make it difficult for me to see everyone, although I am using two, um, two screens. So I may be able to do better than I normally do uh, in terms of seeing who may be raising their hand or um, providing other information in the chat. So if you see me look off to my right, that's me looking at the secondary screen. So today we're gonna to talk about structural racism on people and communities. And then when we finish that discussion, I'll shift to the COVID update. Um, also talking about RSV and influenza is actually where I'll start with in, uh, the health inequity inequalities, then go to RSV, influenza, and then end with COVID. 
Um, I will definitely take a break between uh, these so several topics. Um, I want to make sure that you can actually see the screen. Can you see the slides? Yes, okay, great. So um, by definition, the impact of past and present institutional racism is evidenced by the many inequalities of access to health resources and inequalities of health outcomes. When we look at um, health outcomes and we look at, um, you remember the, uh, the, the step stool where there are three people standing on steps and looking over a fence and the fence never changes position, but the size of the block does. Because it's been so many hundreds of years where inequalities to access um, of health resources have occurred, there needs to be a, uh, an increased amount of um, materials that are used to address uh, access. Access primarily in order to address um, the primary understanding and the primary cause. Structural racism has been and continues to be a major organizing force within our socio-political system. And as a result of that, we have these health disparities as, as people are, are calling it now. Structural racism as defined by um, Dubois is macro level systems and social forces and institutions and ideologies and processes that interact with one another to generate and reinforce inequalities among racial and ethnic groups. Um, this has been published uh, several times, several different ways. Um, most recently in the NIH material. However, when we look at macro level systems, one best uh, tries to figure out, well, what do we mean by macro level? What do we mean by social forces? What do we mean by institutions? Um, it is that which shapes and forms how we function at a larger level. I do a lot of work uh, around the, the, the world and macro level systems changes country to country, region to region. But in the US, the macro level system is our, I'm, I'm calling it a sick care system. We don't really have a healthcare system. And the more I engage with the system that says that uh, we're going to decide what kind of medicine someone has access to rather than look at what is the medicine that they need and how do we put in place those things that prevent us from actually becoming sick. The US has a system that is based on not preventive medicine, but on addressing people's level of sickness. Uh, if we were to take some of the things that we're going to talk about later and actually enforce them uh, in terms of environmental exposure and climate change, we would actually make a difference at the preventive medicine level. Much of the world is trying to deal with preventive techniques where the U.S. is actually dealing with how we're going to address sickness. Um, I am a firm believer in preventive medicine, in preventive care. Let's stop something from happening before it does or address those things that make it worse. Um, <clears throat> and when you look at uh, that which reinforces inequalities, when we're looking at sick care systems and people's lack of access, a uh, a, a lack of access that is continues to come about because someone can't get care. Meanwhile, if we've just built a sidewalk and allowed them to 
can walk um, uh, in comfort in uh, with reduced ability to be harmed by passing vehicles or, or ride a bike because they have uh, bike trails, um, we would do much better if we look at the numbers of pedestrian accidents and bicycle accidents where people are trying to get exercise, ex exercise, trying to do those things that will improve their health. But because we don't have built structures that make it easier for them to do that, the in inequities and inequalities continue to rise. Um, health inequities are avoidable inequalities in health between groups and people within countries and between countries. We saw that with um, COVID vaccines where um, there were three or four countries that had access to all of the COVID vaccines that they wanted, so much so that they wasted them. They let them expire and had to be tossed in the garbage. Where we had countries uh, in Southern Africa, many countries in South America, uh, many places here in the United States in rural US that did not have access, but yet we had uh, uh, countries and areas just throwing them in the garbage because they let them expire. That's inequality, that's a difference in access. Inequalities and inequities continue to rise within and between societies, as I just uh, gave an example. Social and economic conditions and the effects of people's lives determine their risk of illness. When your risk of illness is determined by your zip code, that's a problem. In the US, the the zip code in which you live determines whether you have access to a hospital, whether you have access to primary care, whether you have access to testing that is necessary, whether you have access, and I like using um, uh, 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 built structures as an, as an example. When you look at, um, playgrounds and what's available on the playground and how far do you have to go in order to get the playground, get to a playground? Is the playground accessible uh, at times of day or are we using the school playgrounds, which means they're not accessible during the daytime. And that means that someone who wants to go exercise, who works in the evening, uh, and so their daytime is when they can get their exercise and has nowhere to go. Uh, it's the zip code that makes the difference. Um, how do we take action to prevent people from beginning becoming ill or treat the illness uh, when it occurs is based on zip code in the United States. So when we look at the social determinants of health, when we look at the five key areas, this is an, an older slide. This is the 2020 slide. The 2030 slide um, does is, is more cumbersome, so I tend not to use it because it still has the same um, five key areas. Um, economic stability. When someone, and we really saw this with COVID, depending on the type of job someone had, they worked in the food industry or the delivery industry made a huge difference in their economic stability. Um, what, when, whether or not someone got furloughed during COVID and how long were they furloughed? Um, I have a cousin that was furloughed the entire time and just went back to work three months ago. Excuse um, me. Yes. The slides are not advancing. We still see the first slide, which is a blue slide, talking about the impact of past and present oh structural my. incidents. Yeah, that's I'm on the slide, only slide number six. Let me see. I'm sorry. Thank you for saying such. Um, hmm. Let me take this out.
sometimes it helps to stop sharing and then reshare. Okay, okay now, me, now we see another blue slide. All right, let me, uh, let me do what you suggested here. Okay. All right. This was the okay. slide that showed um, structural racism and its definition uh, as released in the article, the NIH article, macro level systems, social forces, institutions, ideologies, and processes that interact with one another to generate and reinforce inequities among racial and ethnic groups. Um, I won't go through this slide again because I wanna take the time to, um, well, no, I actually will. Uh, health in inequities are avoidable in inequalities in health and between groups of people within countries and between countries. These inequities arise from inequalities within and between societies. Social and economic conditions and their effects on people's lives determine their risk of illness and the actions taken to prevent them from becoming ill or treat the illness when it occurs. Here's where we were. The social determinants of health are the five, are, have five key areas, economic stability, education, social and community context, health and healthcare, neighborhood and built environment. Why is it important to look at social determinants of health when we're talking about um, health inequalities and health access? It's because not, not our economics, our education, our social and our neighborhood all impact health and health care. Um, health, economic stability, whether or not someone can, and that's at all ages. Um, we have better systems in terms of Medicaid or CHIP, <coughs> excuse me, for um, youth and, and children. However, and we have some things in place for our seniors, but if a person does not have a good, a, a senior does not have a good retirement plan where they actually have insurance beyond Medicare or a Part C, uh, or ability to buy groceries to go along with getting their, uh, their, their health taken care of. They can eat the foods that are required of them. It is very easy and more uh, economic. Uh, it's cheaper, let's put it that way. It is cheaper to buy high starch, high salt foods than it is to buy fruits and vegetables. And when we look at that in combination with neighborhood and built environment, and we look at uh, food deserts, and we look at the kinds of foods that are available in uh, lower economic areas, and in particular in many um, areas of black and brown where the, the neighborhood grocery store has uh, wilted lettuce and uh, many canned vegetables rather than fresh vegetables. And the fruit looks like it's been run over by a truck. Um, that combination of food inequity, food access uh, leads to increased uh, health disparities. Uh, when you have places like uh, Bethel Ardmore, where they give away fresh vegetables, uh, that is not common around the country. That's not common in Pennsylvania. It's not common in the Philadelphia metro area. Uh, the, the economic stability and the neighborhood uh, context it, it brings a lot of things to bear. Does the neighborhood, I keep talking about um, walking paths and bicycle paths and, and um, playgrounds, uh, does the neighborhood have that kind? Or is it <clears throat> inner city where the congestion of people 
brings about higher rates of infectious diseases? Do people have access to things that will, like heat, or are they creating heaters that um, ultimately uh, cause increased um, emissions <clears throat> in their home and therefore cause uh, problems with lungs? Uh, education. Education is important in that one, it leads to economic stability, but there's a difference between literacy, reading literacy, and health literacy. There are PhDs who don't understand a word, what is said to them when they go to the healthcare system. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I use my example. I may be a physician with a with a public health background, but when I go to talk to my accountant, as I will do next month, uh, most of the time I tell her, just try to talk in English. <laughs> don't use terminology that I don't understand because I am not a CPA. What do I need to bring to you? What are all the pieces? Yes, I've learned a lot uh, as I've become more hands-on with my own uh, taxes and finances because she has taken the time to teach me. But um, when I talked to her, we've become friends over the last 25 years. Uh, when I talk to her about her health issues, I, there's a different way I speak to her than I speak to my colleagues. And when we are in systems where we're now down to eight minutes a person for a health visit, there's not much time to translate. So some we have to make sure that we have advocates that go with people who are not health literate to be able to understand what is being said to them so that they can then adjust and make the proper moves. This slide is the, the, the one of the, it's been updated several different times. Um, World Health Organization, when we started, first started talking about social determinants of health, put in several things that are not in uh, our CDC version of social determinants of health. And I wanted to make sure we bring them out because they are important and um, they still exist as issues. So the socioeconomic and political context talks about our governance, our policy, our culture and social norms. Um, those interact between education and occupation and income and gender and ethnicity and race, as well as social position. The problem that we have uh, in the, the US in general and in areas where the politics say we are not going to look at all aspects of life, but just a particular set, and then set policy based on that. We are not taking into consideration these things that are in the second column, social position, education, occupation, income, gender, and ethnicity and race. I tend to believe that our macroeconomic policies and our social policies are often driven by things that don't particularly care about humans on an individual as well as a collective level. We may be looking at them on a collective level, but not how does that actually impact a citizen, a single citizen and the area in which they live. We have to be able to take those social determinants of health and health inequities and look at, at the material circumstances. What is the context? What's happening around? What's the social cohesion? When we talk about social cohesion, we talk about things um, like, um, uh, <clears throat> when we, we talk about uh, religious involvement, or community level involvement? Are we uh, engaged with others? COVID did a horrible thing to us by causing many of us to become separated. Yes, we use Zoom to be able to communicate, to be able to talk to people, but 
the reality is um, we like looking at each other one-on-one. -on -one. We like uh, being able to, to uh, give a hug, but we can't do that anymore and feel safe. And when we get to the COVID numbers, I'm gonna show you why winters are worse. Winters when we have isolation anyway, because people don't go out when it's 20 degrees, when there's snow on the ground, when there's ice on the ground. And so we see each other less, but that's also the COVID time. And so even if the weather got to be a good day where it was 48 degrees yesterday, and we could have been walking around talking to each other. When we look at the COVID numbers, we know that's probably not a good idea. Um, and so between the social cohesion and how we work together with the psychosocial factors of feeling a sense of isolation and um, being in despair creates behaviors that do not foster well-being. Behaviors of um, sexually acting out of um, alcoholism and other addictions, of uh, inappropriate behavior in terms of violence. Um, <clears throat> violence goes went up during COVID. Uh, domestic violence, interpersonal violence, uh, as well as uh, other gun violence went up during COVID. It went up because people were feeling isolated and in despair is one of the things that um, the psychologists and psychiatrists are believing. And then we have the biological factors. Um, <clears throat> we have the biological factors of inheritance. And what we also know is our DNA can be changed uh, by certain exposures. Cancers can be brought out by different exposures. Uh, it is believed that in the Mississippi Valley, in the New Orleans and the other Delta uh, areas, the diabetes rate is highest in the country there because of exposures to the breakdown of plastics, because that's where the plastic factories are. So those kinds of things impact not only our DNA that we've inherited, but our DNA can actually be changed and modified and create atmospheres, create um, vulnerability, vulnerabilities that impact health. Our healthcare system is impacted by all of these things. Does one have access to care? I look at what happened with um, over the last 10, 12 years with community health centers and community hospitals and their continued decrease because there is no income for them because people that lived in the areas where community hospitals and community centers tend to predominate lost jobs. And so Medicaid does not pay hospitals high enough and, and many people are not uh, and Medicaid eligible because they're in the sandwich. They make just enough money to not qualify for Medicaid. And so they have no access. So they're using emergency rooms for care rather than a primary care system where they're actually seen as an outpatient can be followed. And so they, by the time they decide that they really are sick enough to go to get seen, it's in the emergency room where they wind up getting admitted, the hospital bills are, are very high and there's nobody to reimburse them, reimburse the hospitals for the actual expense. And so further and further do people have to go to get care, um, which then further impacts their, um, I'll just wait until I have no other choice attitude. Therefore the distribution of health and well-being. It's, it's a cycle, it's a, it's a catch-22 that just keeps going round and round and round. But uh, John Chazelle said, 
um, the greatest state of aliveness that an individual can achieve that will allow them to reach his or her highest potential and their greatest good is optimal health. And that requires that we take into consideration another five pieces, physical health, intellectual health, socioeconomic health, emotional health, and spiritual health. He had it in a different order. I put spiritual health on the bottom because I believe that a person's um, interaction with others as well as their interaction with their higher being, whether it, um, regardless of their religion, will make that thing that undergirds and supports everything else they do. And so in order to achieve optimal health, one has to not only have all of the social determinants of health in place, but these five as well, many of which overlap and they're just called uh, different things by different people. Um, I'm gonna stop here for a second and good, I've got good timing here. Um, before I go to the other topic, are there any questions? I'm gonna stop sharing. Any questions, comments? I have Talk. a question. Yes, ma'am. At some point I've read uh, reports of hospitals that did a study and found that the people, there was a certain group of people who came the most often to the emergency room and had all kinds of other related problems. And they, they assigned staff to follow those people and follow up with the people. But I also remember reading that you would expect that that would have a long-term positive impact. And yet it's not, uh, it's not clear that it necessarily did. And I just wonder if you're aware of those studies and, and what you could share about that. Um, the studies that I saw on that topic, it depended on what were the other support systems, oh. not just the hospital following up, but was there a system in place, uh, a congregation that um, supported or was someone ad assigned as their personal advocate? Did the congregation say, oh, here, we've got a health commission that's going to allow people to, uh, we're gonna go with you when you go to the doctor. When, when that person calls at an assigned time, uh, put it on speakerphone so we can all hear what needs to happen so that we can help you do that. Um, a hospital's following up is a great tool but if the person still does not have access to good food, um, still does not have that, 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 that hospital system did um, hospital studies all put in place that people could get their medications, but it did not put in place uh, food access and support systems. There were a couple of hospitals in Georgia, I believe, that actually went ahead and put that linked up with congregations and those congregations, those people in those studies actually did better. So one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of with the, the AME Church Health Commission is we started doing that. We started saying, okay, everybody identify whoever is gonna be your health advocate and try to push people to, it doesn't have to be us, it doesn't, it just somebody that you know that you feel comfortable with knowing your health issues and helping that person. And then we've got all of these farms and gardens that we are creating around the world on a Amy Church property that allows people, community people, not the congregation itself, community persons to come get access to decent food. Thank you, uh, thank you. So I think we all, I think one of the things I like about the Ardmore community is the Ardmore community is doing it together. Um, uh, and if we could take that energy and pass it on to everybody else, I think we'd be doing a lot, a lot better off. Um, Emma Bean, I see your hand. Oh, ben, excuse me. 
lots of time to learn and focus on what you're going to spend as much on self care. Um, can you hear me? Um, you're you're garbled, and I think it. I'm not sure why that is though. Emma, how about if you put your question in the chat? Okay, and I'll read it. Okay, all right. Are there others or comments? I'm always looking for comments and people's insight. Emma, you can put your question in the chat and I'll read it. Sister Muriel? Good to see you, Dr. Hey, how are you? Good, thank you. I just wanted to add that one of our local hospitals has that interview process. They actually delve into the individual socioeconomic um, stance. Um, and if needed, they send them when they're discharged with a, a bag of groceries. Um, I think though, some people may feel too embarrassed to admit their needs. And so I think they, they may need to do a little bit more work with them. I'm not sure what they need to do, um, but I think it requires just a little more work. I don't know if it's the hospital's responsibility to do that work. I think they, I think they've taken it upon themselves to do it. Um, and it may be something as minor as getting someone more on that individual's level to speak with them. Can I say yes and no at the same time? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, it's good that the hospital wants to do it, but we are our brother and sister's keeper. Yes. And I think that it is incumbent upon us as community leaders, community persons, that we make sure that we are helping. But one bag of groceries is not going to solve the problem. Correct. It, it will help for about a week, if not less, depending on how many people are in the house. That could be one day. I think and that so, interview interview process also includes those types of factors. Um, what's going on in the household, who's available, um, and then there's follow-up. I still think there needs to be an advocate, mm -hmm. a personal mm -hmm. advocate. Yes, I would agree with that. Reverend Wait, think, Burnett? Yes, you have, have that question? Have Yes, we have a question from Emma Ben, um, and this is what we have written. I think many talk about structural racism, even in medical school curricula. However, in the clinical settings, they focus more on individual agency rather than how systems restrict individual agency. This makes it very difficult to help the most vulnerable populations. Amen and agree. Um, when I went to an HBCU medical school, I went to Morehouse School of Medicine, and we were definitely taught how to then also bring it into the clinical setting. But, and they do a very good job of attempting to teach um, how we at our individual levels can uh, make a difference. However, that is not common. Um, <clears throat> systems require, systems use policy in order to affect the, how they work. It is incumbent upon all of us to uh, impact policy which means we have to be careful about voting. We have to be careful about who we vote for, what we vote for, what is it that we can achieve even beyond the vote um, with making for sure that 
um, the persons that we elected are actually doing what we asked them to do and not their own thing. Because they can say whatever they want to say in order to get elected and then go do something different. We see that all the time. Um, <clears throat> and so you're absolutely correct. Correct. The end, what happens on an individual agency level um, is problematic. But I think we have the ability, if all 38 of us on uh, this call tonight, today, what are we, we're still in the morning, this morning, decide that we're going to work together on a piece of the problem, maybe we make a difference. Oh, we're more than 38 because there's a whole room full of folk over at uh, Bethlehem Israel. <laughs> hey, y'all. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, Emma. Emma has another question, but Emma, it's hard to hear you. So if you could just I know. Type Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Much better. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank I you. think I just had my um, I think I just had my headphones uh, on the wrong side or something. I don't know. Um, but I just, I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation so far. And I'll, I just have one more question because I think um, we see a lot of conversations about structural racism. Um, I think many people are aware of it. I mean, even down to other forms of racism, cultural racism, as it plays out in terms of implicit bias in, uh, you know, interactions between patients and their providers. Um, but a lot of the research that we see always tends to come back to the impact of race on health rather than racism. Or even when they look at the impact of race on health, they look at it as like a cause um, versus saying, for example, um, if you, you know, have high cholesterol or education and its benefits on health, well, that, like you said, can depend on the quality of education or can depend on the number, not just the number of years of education, but that the impact of education on health may differ depending on which racial ethnic group you're in, depending on where you lived, all of these different things with respect to how good that education was. Why do you think that the biomedical research community acknowledges the impact of racism, but doesn't really study it very well. <laughs> you want my honest answer? Yes. My honest answer is because we don't know what to do about it. And for the most part, scientists like getting to an answer, they have a thought one of the things that we have to do well, when we develop studies is we have a thesis statement that says, I expect to get to ABC. But if one doesn't know ABC, they become, well, I can't do anything. I don't know where to start because I don't know how I'll finish. And addressing racism also means acknowledging and accepting not only the implicit bias, but the um, everyone's role in continuing it. Does that make sense? Am I saying that in a way that that makes sense, Emma? Uh oh, where'd she go? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I was I was just responding in the chat. I I completely agree. I think the NIH keeps giving people money for structural to to look at structural racism now, but the reality is that most scientists do feel like it's something that's completely out of their control to tackle on your right. It's easier to pose a hypothesis for which that is, you know, more simplistic than to acknowledge that you would have to change policies. And that's not something that's taught in most <laughs> in most biomedical science classrooms. So thank you. 
I think really that the person, the, 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 the category or the genre of needs to be our social scientists. And our social scientists, for the most part, have not been trained on how to take biomedical work and do that with them. And so one of the things that we did um, when I was, uh, I had a joint faculty appointment between Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, and that was both the MPH and the MD students, the uh, uh, ITC, which is the Interdenominational Theological Center. I was the uh, initial director of the Faith and Health Leadership Institute, as well as um, Clark Atlanta University's Doctorate of Social Work. We took students from the MPH, Doctorate of Social Work and Master of Divinity course, put them in teams in churches around the city so they could learn how to work together. Uh, and they did that for a solid year. It was their practicum for the year. Making a change at individual congregational levels and those congregations were also tasked with making sure their communities were involved. There was a huge change in what was able to be done. Many of those congregations are still actively working together with those three entities. Um, but I think that, oh, Dr. Emma, you and I need to talk. Oh, we need to talk. <laughs> Dr. Burnett, we have another question from Sandra Hall. I'm Go sorry, ahead. I just, someone just put in the chat, uh, Dr. Jeter's, uh, brief bio. She and I need to have a conversation. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> That's good. We have, we have a lot of questions, a very interesting talk. So Sandra yeah. Hall has a question. And then after Sandra, let's move on so we can hear the part about COVID because we want to make sure we don't run out of time. Uh, thank you. And I just would like to say that um, I was given this information and um, I'm glad that I am in attendance. I'm learning a lot. And to all of you who are at Bethel Israel Chapel and to Reverend Burnett, I wanna just say thank you and good morning. Uh, I have uh, a question and concern uh, about what was mentioned, structural racism. Just um, as an example, I have a Bible study group that I um, run on Mondays. And we have a 92 year old who has been um, really working hard to try to get uh, a step glider or a um, to help her up the stairs in her home because she's having difficulty at the age of 92. Um, what besides you know in addition having prayer and everything, uh, a lot of us went into what would be the procedures to try to help her to get this. To make a long story short, she was told that she was not qualified, but through persistence with the uh, those of us who were concerned and also for, with her family, the chairlift, that's the word I was looking for, the chairlift was finally installed in her home. Now, my question uh, to you is, what can be done for our seniors, our elderly, who need that kind of assistance and help? Um, besides, um, I guess, becoming a nag and uh, being persistent, are, are there any other kinds of strategies that you would suggest can be used you know, by church members or concerned individuals for our elderly? <laughs> you gave the best example of what needs to happen. The advocacy that came from you all working is the best example in our present day system. The squeaky wheel gets the oil, unfortunately, but that's the way it is right now. Thank you. Others? Do you see others? 
No, there aren't any other questions. We'd love to hear your, your comments about COVID. All right, I'm going to share my screen one more time because I want to show some slides. As soon as I, here we go, share. All right. Um, I want to show, show you where we are right now. Because COVID is, uh, can you see that COVID picture right now? This, okay. Uh, because COVID, we are no longer really looking at the, the surveillance that was happening, is no longer happening, no longer reporting. Much of what we are doing is having to rely on either hospital numbers or on um, uh, wastewater figures. And so uh, as a result, uh, wastewater is not a direct correlation one-to-one, -one, but it gives us a general idea of what's happening in an area if one's wastewater plant is reporting. And that's the big if. So over, um, over this slide that you have before you now, you will see that our numbers are actually higher than they were last year this time. Far right, this is where we, where we are now. This is the United States nationally. Um, I mean, the next slide gives us Pennsylvania. I cannot drill down. I could drill down to specific uh, wastewater plants, but uh, did not know which ones to pull for us in particular today. So this is Pennsylvania in general. Eve, you can see that Pennsylvania, the, this is 40, the bottom one is 45 days. The top right is six months. The top left is the last year. Start with the last year. You can see the numbers go down during the summer. They bounce around early fall and then skyrocket in the winter. Um, we have higher numbers than we did last winter in terms of how much wastewater there is. Um, when you look at the last six months, Pennsylvania actually got better and then worse again. Same thing again. If you look at the last 45 days, the last 45 days, we are on an upswing. Pennsylvania being this yellow line, we are in an upswing. Uh, what is important to note is um, when you look at the hospitalization rate, even though the hospitalization rate is also rising, with uh, the Northeast being the green line, you can see we are higher than the rest. Uh, the hospitalization rate is not one unto death. Uh, we are, because we have the vaccine and there's some degree of, of, of immunity having been developed because of the, the, the vaccine, uh, we are actually seeing uh, not deaths, not severe hospitalizations where people needed to be put on ventilators in the large numbers that we had in 2020. However, people are still becoming ill. Um, people are um, having to put back in place those protocols that we used last winter to a large extent, if you are not wearing masks in your gathering, you should be. Uh, at this point, as you see, all of these numbers are rising. Um, the, the more congested an area, the more likely it is to occur, the more closer you are together, the more likely you are to spread. Uh, the fact that we are just coming out of these gathering seasons of the holidays, and New Year's, uh, the, rec the numbers are going to continue to increase. We always see an increase after seasons of gatherings. Um, the, the, uh, and this, this is this one right here in the middle, uh, this little bump you get, 
that's the seasons of gatherings of the summer, um, all the way through to uh, Labor Day. So uh, we need to ensure that we are doing all of the preventive measures that uh, we've had, had in place. I'm not gonna go through um, the variants and things because I, looking at the time, we're down to seven minutes. Um, I wanna go through the isolation periods. If a person has a positive test, they are to isolate for five days and be fever free for 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medications as Tylenol, Advil, Aleve, anything like that. Um, day zero is the first day of your symptoms. Then um, if you never develop symptoms, isolate for at least at five days wearing a well-fitted mask around others at home and in public, at home and in public, at home. People tend not to do it at home, but unless you, we are trying to expose others in our household, you still need to walk around in your house with a mask on for five days. Uh, and in, in public, you do it for a, basically a total of 10. During the isolation period, um, uh, avoid travel, avoid contact with high-risk people. How do you know who's high-risk? You don't, so just assume that they are. Um, people walking around with diabetes, do not walk around with a sign that says, hey, I'm diabetic, I'm high risk. So you don't know who you're walking around, whether or not they have, they are high risk. So please be careful, be considerate of others. If a test is negative, um, you have a couple options. One is to repeat the test in a few days, but with at least 24 hours in between the test. And remember, if you have symptoms, it could still be a false negative and so isolate. But the other thing it could be in this um, season could be RSV or flu. Similar isolation number uh, days are um, suggested. So we're treating everything, all respiratory illnesses the same in terms of isolation and prevention. Remember five days, 10 days, repeat testing. There is now a flu and um, COVID over-the-counter test that a person can get if, if they're concerned and don't uh, want to go into a, a, an emergency room, which by the way, are overrun with people right now because of the same situation. Um, if a person has no symptoms and no contact, they can, they should quarantine if they've not been vaccinated, they've not completed the series and have not received all of the boosters as well as the last update. Um, also, if symptoms develop, continue to isolate, but call your healthcare provider, um, really trying to keep people out of the emergency room, but at the same point, if that's your only care source, then go. Um, I talked about the, the, the test kits. Um, the um, COVID tests, T-E, yeah, with an S on the end, C-O-V-I-D-T-E-T-S-T-S dot -E gov, um, you still, you are eligible to receive uh, test kits sent to you in the mail. The, 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 the form is an easy form. It goes to the post office, the post office then sends you, it says four test kits, but my box came with five in it for every household. Dr. Burnett, yes. we only have three minutes left. Would it be okay if we opened up uh, yes. for more questions? Yes. Does anybody have any, I have a question, but I wanna hear from everybody else first. Please feel free to jump in or raise your hand on or, or right in the chat. No question. So I have a question, Dr. Burnett, and, and thank you again for your informative talk. Um, you talked about at the macro level, the sick care system, and you talked about lack of access. But can you address the kind of distrust of the healthcare system? That also seems to me uh, a problem. It, it, it is. Um, I can remember the days where 
Um, if a person were going to a particular hospital, they did not expect to come home. Um, it's also a mistrust of of medications, of such mistrust of clinical trials. And all of that is based in racism and history. Um, history of lack of exposure, history of uh, maltreatment. Uh, it's expected that uh, a person is not going to be treated well when they go to particular um, places. Um, my father was been, has been, he's going to be 95 next month, and he's been in and out of the hospital system uh, over the last six months to a year. And I can tell you, if I had not been standing there on many an occasion, things would not have gone well. And so, yes, there's a, and I'm a physician, have been for over 30 years. And have had to play the physician card on several different occasions. I shouldn't have to do that, but I have. Right. Been forced to do so. Well, it looks like, unless we have any other questions, we've run out of time. Um, Dr. Burnett, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. It was really informative. Um, Sometimes a little sad, but hopefully we can feel some hope for things that we can do uh, to change the systems as they are now. Um, I, I want to I want to read what Emma has put in the chat. Please focus. Focusing on mistrust sometimes leads to further stigmatization of people of color, rather than acknowledging the mistreatment of people of color by the healthcare system. I wanted to read that because it's amen and hallelujah. You could not have said it any better. Yeah. And I'd rather say, instead of sometimes, most often. Because the other thing that happened was, I must think I'm better than everyone else when I demanded the care my father deserved. Okay, so I'll be the bad guy. He's going to get what he's supposed to get. Amen. Okay. Well, again, it was really a great talk. I guess we're ready for our next speaker. Thank you all. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Barry Gold. I am a member of Beth Am Israel, and it is my pleasure to introduce Jamila Miller.